you never know. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, Pastor Rosebro, thank you so much for being willing to come on to Lutheran Answers and talk to me. Uh, my pleasure. Good to meet you, Remy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, so you're pretty well known, I think, overall uh, for the work you do. Oh, I don't want to say against, uh, that, uh, but against, I guess, the hyper charismatic uh, kind of touchy feely sort of Christianity and, and dispelling yeah. those uh, sort of things. I grew up in that. I grew up Pentecostal holiness. And, oh, wow. Yeah. And after that, when I was in my early 20s, I got into the New Apostolic Reformation and went through that. Wow. That was, it was fun. It was, I went to Patricia King's church. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yep, I met the guy from Corn, Brian Welch, because he got yes, big into it. Yes, yes, yes. Super yes. cool guy, though. Uh -huh. um, yeah, yeah. I met him actually at an extreme prophetic conference that uh, my church at the time I think paid for me to go to. <laughs> yeah, and then back in the day, he and Todd White were like constantly hanging out with each other. So yeah, yeah. It was uh, it was a it was a wild time. But I actually ended up in Lutheranism and in the AALC specifically because of fighting for the faith. Um, oh, wow. I, I found the Lutheranism on the Internet, you know, a lot of the different guys that do things on YouTube and whatever. Mm -hmm. And fighting for the faith was, was pretty instrumental for me. And I said, you know what? I want to go to whatever kind of church that guy's a part of. That's the church body I want to go to. And it was the AALC. Wow. And... And I said, you know, what are the odds that there is an AALC church in Fayetteville, North Carolina? Because there's only like 80 and they're all over like the Midwest. Yeah. Um, and it turns out there is one. Like it was 10 minutes from my house. And so, that's you know, awesome. it's coming freshly out of the charismatic thing. I was like, well, that's God, right? Like that's got to be, that's got to be God. And to this day, I, I still think it is. Um, but yeah, okay. you were... Yeah, Go ahead. we don't read omens, but yeah, it seems like God's hand of providence was there. I sound like a reformed guy when I talk like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the hand of, of providence. Um, yes. Yeah, it, you know, but it's, uh, it was a lot of your work, uh, I think, on these topics that really kind of helped me sort of get my head on straight uh, with a lot, of, a lot of my, I don't know, pneumatology, I guess a lot of yeah. my thinking about these subjects and uh my mom as well my mom as well i turned her onto your stuff and she's just like over the moon every time she she listens she she's pentecostal holiness or was uh -huh. she's 73 spent her whole life in it and we played the uh the 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 bingo and uh <laughs> And she couldn't believe it. She couldn't believe it because she's watching all these new people. And, and she says, Remy, I heard this exact prophecy word for word 40 years ago. You yeah. know, like, they're just warming the same stuff up over and over again. It's not even good stuff. It's, it's, it's not. It's, it's like, you know, 40-year-old salad, a word salad. You know, yeah. Just, it doesn't mean anything, and, and people sitting there going, "Ooh, ah!" But there, it's a, there's nothing to these things. That's that's why yeah. we do prophecy bingo to kind of demonstrate that. Absolutely, and it's uh, I don't know. I just I'm I'm kind of geeking out here because I love you a lot, and I think you're great, and I'm glad you decided to be on. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's you know that it was I I definitely when I reached out and. Um, and and got this process rolling i definitely felt that there was a lot of suddenlies in the atmosphere so i'm glad <laughs> you are a very bad man very bad man Remy. <laughs> so i want to ask you sort of in this context when it comes to the holy ghost mm -hmm. what do modern evangelicals think like what, what do they think so modern evangelicalism has legitimately been heavily influenced by second and third wave uh, Pentecostalism. Uh, so when we talk about Pentecostalism, we can talk about it in waves. So the first wave legitimately going back to uh, you know, the Azusa Street Revival and just prior to him, you think of Parham 
and uh, and those fellows who claim that they you know that that God had restored the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and uh, and then you you know second wave could be like the Jesus movement, the Jesus people, you know uh, that you know the Jesus Revolution movie that came out from you know with the you know mm. with, uh, documenting what was going on with the Calvary Chapel movement. Uh, but then you've got you've got a, a third wave of this that that just completely crashed over the church, and so evangelicalism is heavily steeped in charismatic and Pentecostal streams of theology, especially in regard to the pneumatology. And so as a result of it, even if they haven't been fully versed, or even if they don't speak in tongues and you know uh, roll around on the floor and things like this. What they legitimately believe is is either a light form or even a heavy form of the belief that God has restored the gifts of the Spirit of 1 Corinthians. And notice I'm using the word restored because mm. um, nowadays uh, the, uh, the Charismatics and the Pentecostals, they cheat. And the reason why they're cheating is because when, when, you know, back when I was in the, uh, the Latter Rain movement, which was part of the third wave, when, when I was in the Latter Rain movement, uh, everybody at that time recognized that God was restoring prophets and restoring mm. apostles, and they would talk in these terms. And so you've got entire generations of people who've grown up who have no uh, experiential memory of what the charismatic movement looked like in the 80s and 90s. And as a result of it, the, the current crop of, of charismatics and Pentecostals, you know, in their, in their mid-20s and early 30s, they all claim that they're continuationists. And it's like, you don't even understand. It's like your, your theological parents and grandparents never talked about continuationism. They always right. talked about restorationism. So evangelicalism, having been heavily influenced by uh, you know, the, the charismatic movement, their basic, it, it's, it's a very squishy theology in their pneumatology and what they believe that the Holy Spirit is for. Now, granted, uh, some places are going to be a little, give a little bit more depth in teaching than other places, but the general idea is, is that the, uh, the Holy Spirit is there to empower us, uh, but the question as to what he's supposed to empower us to do has changed mm -hmm. dramatically. So, uh, so if you think of first wave Pentecostalism, which comes out of the holiness movement of, uh, of the 1800s, steeped in Wesleyan theology and, uh, and this idea of trying to attain uh, a sense of holy, sinless perfection in this lifetime. Uh, so what ends up happening is, is that in the first wave of Pentecostalism, there's a super heavy emphasis not on prophecy and things like this, but instead that the Holy Spirit is going to supercharge your life for the purpose of helping you attain uh, some level of sinlessness. It's, it's to supercharge your sanctification. Uh, and, and it's almost like cheating. You know, you plug directly into the Holy Spirit and you get that big power up. And, uh, and now, you, now you're ready to roll. But um, you'll note that that didn't really work out. In, in the first wave of Pentecostalism, legitimately, it was just filled with all kinds of grifters and, and people who were less than moral, okay? Uh, and and I, you know, I think of Amy Semple McPherson. This woman was, was an adulteress, okay? Mm. <laughs> it's like, you know, don't, don't tell me about how this Holy Spirit's going to supercharge your life to make you holy while you're out there you know, pulling the stunts that she was pulling. This is, it, it, and, and the thing is, is that they, they always kind of get a pass. They never, when caught on this, you know, there's this cognitive dissonance that goes on. So in the evangelical movement now, the Holy Spirit is the one you need to learn how to listen to. And so, you know, part of, you know, the, uh, the catechism of evangelicalism, when you first become an evangelical, you have to get baptized. Uh, you have to go through a basics class. You need to learn how to hear the Holy Spirit communicating to you. And the Holy Spirit is always apparently talking. It's, it's like a radio station. But you have to learn how to tune in to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, the, and I always like to say that the Holy Spirit that the evangelicals and a lot of charismatics believe in is utterly powerless. The guy mm -hmm. is like, you know, he, he's incapable of doing anything, you know. 
And yeah. so, you know, hi, I, I, I want to tell you what your purpose is, but you, you keep tuning into the wrong station. And, and, and so, you know, I, I can't give you your full purpose until you fully yield and submit to me so that you can actually then get on the right frequency so you can hear my voice. You know, it's weird stuff like this. So you have to, you, you got to learn how to hear the voice of the Spirit who's going to reveal to you your purpose. And then the Holy Spirit is gonna, obviously going to have some some role in sanctification but uh but uh, oddly enough in the current iteration of evangelicalism the holy spirit legitimately is more akin to the force of mm. star wars than it is to the holy spirit of scripture the one wow. who convicts us of our sin the one who uh, who comforts and assures us of the forgiveness of our sins in jesus christ and instead uh, he's the he's the one constantly nudging or making you feel things. Uh, you know, it's like there's a great disturbance in the Holy Spirit, and uh, and there's a shaking and a suddenly coming, and 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 stuff like <laughs> this. And so you have these you have evangelicals legitimately chasing their tails, you know, wondering what their next move is. You know, what is my purpose? What's the thing that God wants me to do? Am I supposed to buy a house right now? Am I supposed to sell my house? Does the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. want me to have this job right now, or? does he want me to date that girl or marry that guy and 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 what's really fascinating is is that you have so many people looking for these promptings for these for they're, they're looking for validation they're looking for legitimate like signs and omens to help yeah. give them guidance on the day to day and the odd bit about it is that oftentimes the things that they're looking for a, a definitive answer from the holy spirit for are the things that are in our uh, in our jurisdiction as far as making a decision about mm -hmm. um, and so as a result of it there's just uh, uh, evangelicals are like in a labyrinth looking for for data from the Holy Spirit when if they would just read their Bibles they realize oh I'm supposed to make this decision <laughs> it's like yeah you know, you know. well and, and it, it does it does a lot to destroy uh, comfort the like the comfort of the scripture. Um, yeah. I, I've had people ask me at my own church, um, people on the internet or whatever, like, how do you make a decision about X, Y, and Z, this job or this house or this girl or boy or whatever? And my answer is always, well, Romans eight twenty eight, which was drilled into me as a kid, and I'm glad mm -hmm. for, says that God works to the good, uh, all things for those you know, that love him. Right. So mm -hmm. great. So what you got to do is look at everything, right. You know, make a little pro con list. If you want, ask your relatives for best advice or your, your friends, wise people, you know, make the best decision you can and just know that God's going to work it out. Yeah. Right. That's a good way to think about it because the, the standard evangelical ease would basically tell you, okay, so you, 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 you are dating so-and-so and, -so and you, you need to ask the question from God, the Holy Spirit, is she the one? And of course the, the question assumes something. It assumes that God mm -hmm. has chosen a specific person for you to marry where scripture is clear. Don't marry a pagan chick. Okay. Uh, <laughs> And so if you if you want to marry a blonde Christian lady or a brunette Christian lady or a redheaded Christian lady or somebody, you know, with with blue hair, you know, it that doesn't matter. OK, God's not sitting there going, I chose for you this particular one that no, 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 you, you, we're, we're given instruction. Don't marry the one that's the idolater who's the unbeliever marry the one who's a believer so you can marry any of those any of those eligible women if they're willing to marry you that's a whole other issue you know and 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 there is no specific soulmate that god has chosen for mm -hmm. you so you need to make a wise decision which requires you to be in the scriptures and knowing what wisdom even is you know yeah. maybe a, a very in-depth study of the book of proverbs would be super helpful because if you make a bad decision about who you marry it can make your life a living hell that's yeah. you know and, and unfortunately that that's that's a legitimate thing even for christians mm -hmm. but it's it, at the end of the day it's not because you didn't choose your soulmate or you failed to hear the voice of the holy spirit or you you you, you didn't pray enough or fast enough or you weren't patient enough to let god tell you which you know which one he's chosen for you that's that's not it at all 
Uh, and I and, and so what's weird is is that in evangelicalism, they've got things backwards. So they believe that when it comes to the things of God as, as an unbeliever, that I have decisions that I have to make. But when it comes to the things of man, my, my conscience is completely bound to whatever the guiding wow. principle of the Holy Spirit is. But you got to flip it. When it comes to the things of God, we have a bound conscience and we, we have we're in a, in a dead will that God has to regenerate. And then when it comes to the things of this earth, we're the ones who legitimately get to make those decisions, and we have to make them prayerfully in accord with what God has laid out in his word, which requires us to be uh, in the word constantly. So, um, and then if you if you kind of further expand on this, in, in much of evangelicalism now, uh, there is an overt move against scripture reading uh, and in favor of chasing after these experiences, and so much so mm -hmm. that the, in, the, in the evangelical, there's a pejorative language that's being used of people saying things like, well, you know, there's, there's those folks like Lutherans and the Reformed, you know, they, they believe in Father, Son, and Holy Bible, but we believe in the Holy Spirit and stuff like this. And, uh, and that's, these are just major category errors you know, all around, no matter how you slice it. But uh, yeah, no, I, I just remember as a, um, as a charismatic and an evangelical, it was, it was just a constant sense that I was in, the fo in a fog, not knowing what the, what the next thing was for me, and piously thinking that I had to somehow do particular things in order mm -hmm. to get the attention of the Holy Spirit so that he would then tell me the thing to do. And, and, I, and the, the worst part about it is, is that I was constantly told in the messaging that I was getting is that the more absurd that you, the, the thing that the Holy Spirit tells you to do, the more likely that's actually the Holy Spirit. And you need to learn how to be obedient on the spot, you know. And so obedience isn't gauged by the Ten Commandments anymore. It's obedience is gauged on your willingness to follow through in obedience to the thing you think that the Holy Spirit is speaking into your heart, but you're not 100% sure that that's even him to begin with. Hmm. It, did you, um, so a couple of things that stood out to me, um, you, you were talking about, um, like Wesleyan perfectionism, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's, it's run through sort of these, these kinds of the holiness movements and things like that. And it's yeah. funny because you actually see that still picked out little bits in like the NAR and the hyper charismatic movement. You can still see it in there, um, a, when they blame you, when things don't happen, when, yeah. you know, your suddenlies don't shake the, you know, the new promise or whatever, and then the thing yeah. doesn't happen. It's because you have sinned. You don't have enough faith. You messed up, right? Um, and the thing I heard a lot, a lot of whenever I would go to a pastor or an elder and say, like, uh, swearing, like, oh, you know, I, I, I got a mouth like a sailor. You know, um, the, the thing that I would get hit with, uh, wasn't anything practical. There wasn't any forgiveness of sins, uh, no counseling. No, the thing what? that I got hit with, yeah, shocking. The thing I got hit with was, um, well, just remember you don't have an X, Y, and Z spirit. You have the Holy spirit, don't you? Right. You have the, you have the Holy spirit in you. And that's that, that's that supercharged sanctification idea sort of mm -hmm. creeping back up, right? This, well, you shouldn't act that way because the spirit that's in you isn't a lustful spirit or a prideful spirit or whatever. It's, it, it should be the Holy Spirit, right, is what's in you. Yeah, but they're right to a point, but it's like they, they, they're, they're like mangling things. So yeah. one of the things uh, when, when I teach adult confirmation uh, is I, I always strongly advise that uh, that somebody – read some of the writings of the church fathers especially augustine on his on the letter in the spirit you can actually find this online for free it's in the public domain saint augustine on the letter in the spirit and he addresses the the, the role of the holy spirit in the life of a christian and 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 the emphasis is on sanctification like true holiness right mm -hmm. and augustine he has this wonderful argument in fact the 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 lutheran reformers rely heavily on his work in the apology of the augsburg confession against their arguments against rome but the basic idea is this is that um we are justified by grace through faith 
faith. We are sanctified also by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so when you read Romans 7 and 8 together, kind of as a unit, keep reading, you, you'll see that Romans 7 leaves us off with this idea that there's a stalemate between your, the new person that you are in Christ compared to uh, the, the old, uh, your, your old sinful nature, your old sinful flesh. And so Paul makes it clear. He says, the things I don't want to do, I do. The things I want to do, I don't do. Who's going to rescue me from this body of death? But then, you know, so when it comes to the, this pitched battle between the, the regenerate person that you are in Christ and, uh, and your old sinful flesh, the battle constantly ends up you know, in a stalemate. And, and Paul kind of summarizes it very briefly in Galatians 5 using this, these terms that your sinful flesh, its desires are contrary to the spirit. And so Paul in Romans 8 and Augustine picks up on this very heavily, basically says that we are by the power of the spirit, by the spirit to put to death the deeds of the flesh, which he then goes on to say requires us to humbly Ask God daily to grant us the strength to mortify our sinful flesh, which doesn't sound super sexy to me. That just sounds like a, it's the, the, the drudgery of the Christian life, and that's exactly what it is. And, and he, Augustine actually brilliantly argues that this is this requirement that God has put that we humbly ask the Holy Spirit to give us the strength to put to death the deeds of the flesh on a daily basis is, is a necessary requirement because if we were to do it on our own, we would brag and then make ourselves mm -hmm. arrogant, and then that would put us back under God's judgment. And so when you read the work, it's, it's really fascinating. It basically says, so here's the idea. You wake up in the morning and you say, Holy Spirit, please help me. To, to obey your commands. Your word says not to do these things, but my sinful flesh wants to do these things. And, and, and so I want to obey your commands, but I don't have the strength in and of myself to do so. So please grant today that I, that I obey your words and your commands. And so you get to the end of the day, and of course none of us gets to the, gets to the end of the day without sin. That's just not gonna happen. But what's fascinating is, is Augustine basically says, and so when you get to the end of the day and God the Holy Spirit has answered your prayer and given you some progress or given you some strength against the desires of your sinful flesh, you have got nothing to brag about, okay? Because you sit there and go, oh, he gave me the, he gave me the thing I asked for and he answered my prayer to him be all the glory. But uh, if, if in kind of the charismatic parlance, well, I, I glow in the dark. I have the Holy Spirit inside of me, and I speak in tongues and things like this, and so I can slay demons and command and decree and declare and all this kind of nonsense. And you're just an intolerably prideful being who refuses to recognize just how sinful you are. And then add into the fact that in the modern charismatic movement, you have the weed of the word of faith heresy just running wild. Mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you have people legitimately saying, well, if I say that I'm a sinner, then I've negatively confessed. And so uh, mm. when, they, when people come up against a sin problem like we all do, you know, they'll sit there and they, they can't say, I confess that I am by nature sinful and unclean. I've sinned against God and thought, word, and deed by what I've done and by what I've left undone. That's a negative confession. Instead, they have to say, I confess that I believe by faith that I am the head and not the tail, that, uh, you know, that I am, I am the victor and not the victim and all this kind of weird stuff. And they haven't asked God for anything. They haven't confessed any sins at all. And you sit there and you go, what is this religion? Because the, the spirit of this religion, the Holy Spirit of this religion, is a completely different Holy Spirit than the biblical Holy Spirit. And, uh, and you know, so there is the, the, the Holy Spirit plays a vital role in Christian sanctification, for sure. But you're going to have to humbly confess your sins and ask God for help. And then when he gives that to you, you'll have nothing that you can brag about and say that you've accomplished other than to say, thank you, Lord, for giving me the strength today to obey your commands. It, it's funny because as these things so often do, once again, it, it removes all of the comfort of Scripture, right? Like, and it, it's when, when I lose my temper, uh, I'm not shocked, <laughs> right? I know, I know what kind of person I am, uh, and I confess it every Sunday at church, daily in my prayer time. I know what kind of person I am, and I know, you know, how far off. Uh, the mark I am on my own, right? But in yep. this charismatic theology, when you're trying to 
when you're trying to decree and declare your way out of sin, when things don't work out, I find that, especially for me, when I was going through it, it had such a negative impact on my whole entire faith. Like you almost want to walk away from the faith entirely because like, why isn't it working? Yeah. So for me, I was a Nazarene when I was in high school. And that's a that's a bad time to be a Nazarene. Okay, yeah. when uh, when puberty hits, especially in the 1980s, when you know all the girls are wearing dolphin shorts, and it's like you know, and they're a visual distraction of sin, you know, just all over the place. It was just, this was not a good time. And I, you know, I and and I remember going to my youth pastor in the Nazarene church, and understand Naz- Nazarene church is is the holiness movement of the 1800s combined with a slight element of Pentecostalism. The Pentecostal uh, ideas broke into two branches in Los Angeles at that time. So you had the Azusa Street Revival, and then you had the preaching, the holiness preaching of Phineas Brzee, who was uh, one of the major founders of the uh, of the Nazarene Church. And he taught that Christians can experience what's called the second blessing holiness. Uh, that, that and that's the Nazarene version of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And once you once God kind of touches you and you have the second blessing of holiness, you're supposed to be able to at that point to experience that perfectionism that Wesley wrote about in a plain account of Christian perfection. Well, what, the it never worked out for me. <laughs> okay, it just. It, I was just way too just red-blooded American heterosexual teenager, okay? This isn't working out. So I, I went to my youth pastor and said, you know, I've got a problem. And, you know, and that is, is that girls are really cute. And, uh, and, and, and my mind is always going in the wrong, wrong, wrong direction. And, and, and his response was, Chris, don't worry about it. Just love God. And, uh, and, and, you know, he'll, he'll do the rest. And it's like, just love God? It's like, do you not understand that the reason why I'm struggling with sin is because clearly I don't love God enough, okay? Hmm. Because every transgression of his holy law shows a complete deficiency on my part to be able to love him. And so I was really, really just down in the dumps. And f- oddly enough, it's those unsatisfactory answers that I got from my pastors when I was a Nazarene that set me up to go into the latter rain. Uh, you know, because I, I thought these people were just too lukewarm. They weren't taking this stuff seriously enough. Wow. And so, you know, we went, my wife and I, we were, we, were, uh, we were engaged at the time. We went whole hog into the latter rain because we were looking for a glow in the dark, supercharged, Holy Spirit powered. Uh, way to to get on the fast track to perfection, and uh, that didn't work out. We ended up just being deceived in, in a cult. Yeah, we had here's a here's a fun. This is a fun story for you. Fun anecdote. We uh, my uh, church growing up had a spell where we kind of went through several different youth pastors, and the shortest one, the shortest one that he was only there for a couple of months before they fired him and they fired him because he tried to do confession and absolution. He tried, he tried to get people to, uh, do a corporate confession and he encouraged people to come to him privately with confession and do absolution. And everybody was so freaked out by that, that they fired him. Wow. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? Yeah, so the so here's the weird bit. So back when I was a Nazarene, okay, despite the fact I'm supposed to have the second blessing of holiness and all this kind of other stuff, I you know, I when my wife and I finally got married, uh we we ended up leaving Pentecostalism but stayed in the Nazarene church. Don't ask me why. And uh, and pretty quick, you know, pr- pretty shortly after my wife and I got married, we ended up with we had two kids. And I remember, pl- you know, plopping our tiny little children uh, into our minivan and, and driving off to church. And of course, uh, anybody with small kids knows that these people are unreasonable. 
uh, you know, I, this is this is uh, kids. You know, tiny kids are not known for their uh, great negotiation skills. Uh, it, you know, the, instead screaming at the top of their lungs and stuff like this. And it just cracks me up because I, I distinctly remember driving into the church parking lot with like my fingers clenched on the steering wheel because my wife and I were arguing beca- over the kids who were screaming mm. at the top of their lungs. And it was like, ah, this horrible thing. But as soon as we, we got into the parking lot and the, and the parking lot attendants were there, we put on our church face. Okay, oh, yeah. we were as happy as can be, and, and and you get out of the car, and somebody says, yells at you, we're blessed to be here, brother. And, oh, yeah, that's right, brother, we're just blessed, you know, we're blessed to be a blessing, and, and all this kind of stuff. And inside, you're dying because you know that just 30 seconds before you hit the parking lot, you were not at your best, you were at your mm-hmm. worst, and it's... And it was, and the word, the worst bit about it is, is that because of the way they didn't balance out law and gospel, it was always super heavy on the law, and some of it just made up. Uh, you can never confess what you were struggling with. There was no mm. way to actually unburden your conscience, and it just seems like sin upon sin just kept piling up. And you, and you know, the idea of actually looking at somebody and and saying, listen. I know we're supposed to not dance, drink, smoke, or chew, or go with girls who do, but dang, the other day I was, you know, I, I, <laughs> I downed two beers after I got home from work, and if, if you said something like that, they go, <gasps> mm-hmm. oh my goodness, scandalized, right? And, and the thing is, is that they're doing it too. That's the, that's the weird yep. bit about it. So you have all these people putting a lot of effort into this facade of, of self-righteousness that they put on. But at no point do, you, do they even connect the idea that the gospel actually applies to Christians. Uh, you know, the, the gospel is always kind of in the rear view mirror. The, the gospel right. is the thing you preach to the unbeliever so that they can make a decision for Jesus. And then they get to go into the fun park of all law, you know, and which is not a fun park. It's and it, but it, 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 I remember several times thinking, why am I even doing this? Because clearly I'm not pulling this off. I mean, as far as sanctified holiness Nazarenes went, I was not ne- anywhere near the cream of the crop, and I, it always bothered me when somebody would come up on stage at at our church and and talk about uh, the victory that they were having in Jesus. I would look at them and go, "How are they able to pull this off when I'm not? Mm-hmm. I I don't understand." And it really, really defeated me. And um, and it was around that time that I started attending Concordia University, Irvine. That was my first exposure to confessional Lutherans, and I thought these people weren't even saved. It's like, what, uh, what have I got myself into? These guys look like a bunch of failed Roman Catholics, and uh, and 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 their the super structure of their liturgy is clearly offending the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's mm-hmm. long gone, and these people they can't possibly be saved because they're not even trying. You know, it, it, it you know, and so it, uh, yeah. I had I had. Uh old teachers because i the the church i went to had a school and that was where i was educated k-12 i was at this pentecostal holiness school and i had teachers and guidance counselors and whatnot reach out to my mom after it became public that i was a lutheran and that i was going to school and would hopefully get ordained as a lutheran pastor one day and like this is where i'm at and i had people reaching out to my mom because they were worried about my salvation Right. (laughs) So, yeah, yeah. It's it's funny, too, the weird parallel to to Mormonism. When I was involved in the NAR, I lived out in Mesa, Arizona, which I think outside of Utah is the largest grouping of Mormons. Um, Mm -hmm. And I mean, I know I know I've probably met thousands of Mormons. I even still to this day, whenever the missionaries knock on my door, I invite them in, I feed them, we talk. Um, I love them to death. But it's amazing how many Mormons I knew that had coffee pots, and you're not allowed to have coffee. But they all have yep. coffee pots, and if you ask them, they all say, oh, we make hot chocolate in it. Oh, yeah, we all make hot chocolate in our coffee pots. That's what mm-hmm. we buy them for, because they're great for that. But I had a, a friend of mine tell me, uh, one day it was just me and him, you know, hanging out, kind of the, the mask comes down and, and he was like, no dude, we're all drinking coffee. 
you know, we're not supposed to, but we all lie to each other about it because you can't say that you're drinking coffee, you yeah. know, and it's, it's just the, the weird parallel there. Yeah, no, and that's and see the thing is is that I I think the Lutheran reformers got it right when they pointed out that when it comes to religions on planet Earth they they legitimately argue that there are only two, there are only two religions on the planet. There is the religion of works, which takes on many different forms and has many different lists by which people claim that they can merit God's favor and earn salvation. And the Nazarene Church, because of their their incorrect distinction between law and gospel, and ends up quite inadvertently, but still, it, it's nonetheless they end up there. They end up as a religion of works. And I, I remember distinctly when I would hear Dr. Rosenblatt. Dr. Rod Rosenblatt was is my mentor, who legitimately I. I credit him with preaching the gospel that ended up saving my life and keeping me from putting a bullet in my mouth. Hmm. But uh, Rosenblatt, uh, this was a fellow, you know, when when I I, I loaded up on his uh, on his courses, my you know my first and second year there at uh, Concordia, and one of the things that was that just really stuck out to me is number one, he couldn't possibly be saved because he wasn't even trying. But man, this guy kept every single class he found a way to talk about the fact that salvation is completely by the merits of christ that that mm -hmm. the scriptures make this clear we do not earn our salvation even in part but it's given to us completely as a gift by god's by god's grace through faith and as a nazarene when i heard that i thought he was a heretic i thought what he was saying was dangerous and I went up to him after class one time, and I said, Rosenblatt, if what you're saying is true, and we're saved completely by what Christ has done for us, then you're saying that we can do whatever we want. Because I was hearing it as, well, that's a license to sin. Mm -hmm. It's like, and so he looks at me and goes, well, of course, Chris. He says, well, now that Christ has set you free from slavery to sin, death, and the devil, what do you want to do? <laughs> and I yes. went, yes. Uh, I got to go. <laughs> you know, I did, did not expect that answer. But it's yeah. like, you know, I, I realized that there were there were like entire biblical categories that I did not even know. And, and the thing is, is that my Nazarene experience with the church that I was attending, Pasadena Nazarene, they, they had bought into this idea of small group Bible studies. And th these things were horrifyingly awful. But uh, what, so, we, you know, there was this uh, older couple, they were, pro you know, <laughs> boy, I got to be careful what I was going to say here. <laughs> uh, we, so I was a teenager and they were in their 50s and I'm in my 50s right now. <laughs> this older couple. This super yeah, so, young couple. Yeah, right, right. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, my wife cl still claims she's 29. I don't know how that works, but, uh, but. All of that being said, we, so we be in their house, and there was other people from the from the church, and there were some people that were our age. But what they always would do is that they would start off the Bible study with uh, with a reading uh, one or two verses, totally out of context, you know. Okay, and then I kid you not, after the prayer, they would go around the room room and they would ask this question: What does this verse mean to you? Mm. And boy, oh boy, were the answers that, that we all spewed out just nuts. But the one th <laughs> I, I can legitimately tell you that that, that messed me up because yeah. at no point did it actually register to me that the Bible actually has a message dictated by the author of Scripture, you know, like mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit, and that my job wasn't to figure out what this verse meant to me. It was actually to figure out what did the author intend, mm -hmm. what, what does it mean? And, right. uh, and so, you know, it, it, uh, there were so many things in this subjective, hide your sin, uh, you know, uh, bizarre theology that was, you know, that I bought into that just set me up for the latter rain movement. And when my wife and I went into the latter rain, I mean, like I said, we went whole hog. And the, 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 the church, if you can call it that, that we were attending, uh, was a church run by a lady who claimed that she was one of the new prophets that God had just restored to the earth. 
and and she had like complete wow. control over my wife and I. They prophesied over us that we were going to have five kids. Well, that didn't work out. We only had three, uh, and uh, and I was required after a, a, a you know, kind of a short amount of time that we were there. I was required to hand my paycheck over to this lady, and she would take out her part of it and give back to me a stipend that my wife and I were supposed to live on. Wow. That's the kind of control that they had over us. Wow. And of course, to question her is to question God. Because yeah, I mean, right. I mean, she was she was constantly in dialogue with God. I mean, I mean, you know, she'd be brushing her teeth, and God would be talking to her while she's brushing her teeth and stuff. You know, did you know? Did people at at that church or at any point in your experience did they ever do that like really weird, cringy thing where they like? Um, all of a sudden can like audibly hear God and like begin just like having this oh, like yeah. converse, but you can only hear like one part of it, you know, like it just like yeah, yeah. you and me talking, they'd be like, what? Hang on. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I'll tell him. Yeah. No, would... I don't want to. Okay. I'll tell. And it's like, what are yeah. you doing? <laughs> yeah. She, she would do that. Well, she didn't do it very often, but she did do that. But uh, the, the, the guy who's mastered that technique is Ken Copeland. You know, because uh, you know, Ken Copeland, you, if you watch any of his teaching videos, he'll, he'll be in mid-sentence, he'll go, yes, sir. Oh, shit, sir, I'll tell him, sir. <laughs> I, Hans Feeney did a video um, about how <laughs> Kenneth Copeland is actually just the devil in a Ken Copeland suit. Yes. And, like, how true is that? More and more every day. Yeah. No, I, out of out of the people that I've been covering on fighting for the faith, there are only just a small number of one of people that I legitimately think are like demonized. Mm -hmm. Ken Copeland is one of them. Yeah. Um, and you know, it, it, there is something uh, diabolical in his eyes. I kid you not. He gives me the creeps um, during the whole COVID thing. COVID nineteen. You know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, that whole thing. I mean, just look at his eyes and tell me, there some that what's looking back at us ain't human. Mm -mm. And and the scriptures legitimately say that in the last days, that uh, that people would follow deceiving spirits and teach the doctrines of demons. It, I mean, I cannot think of a man who is more fitting that description than Ken Copeland. Especially because you look at um, other guys. That um, like, I don't know. You look at you look at Joel Osteen, okay, and uh, he's just a, a motivational speaker that's dressed up like a preacher, right? And that's that seems kind of pretty clear that that's where he's at, right? Um, yeah. Guys like uh, uh, what's his name, Robert Tilton, um, or even like Jesse Duplantis. It's oh, a yeah. grift. It's a grift. And you can tell yeah. it's a it's just a grift, right? That's all it is. But like uh, you're right, Kenneth Copeland, I don't know. There's something not correct there. No. There's the no. when and that the, video of him getting confronted on his plane. Oh. I, oh yeah, unsettling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that look that he gave when that lady confronted him, that was horrible horrifying it was yeah, and, and and i would say there's one other person i can think of right off the top of my head who has that kind of same look to her and that's that that's the the, the new and upcoming apostle Catherine crick i mean mm. just watch that lady and you sit there and go something ain't right with her i mean it is legitimately something is really really wrong mm. and uh yeah so you know, and the thing is, is that we shouldn't be surprised by these kinds of things because, you know, did you know that out of the 27 books of the New Testament, only one doesn't warn us about false teachers? Wow. <laughs> All, oh, the only one. And that's that. And that's the uh, the epistle of Philemon, you know, which is a letter <laughs> written to the owner of a slave who is being sent back. Uh, that, that's the only one, and every other book of the New Testament actually legitimately warns us in large, in large chunks about false teachers. There's only one wow. book in the New Testament that doesn't warn us about false teachers. That's amazing. What, I mean, okay, so that gets, this gets me to um, another part of, I, I had an outline um, that I think, we've done okay, we've done okay. Um, 
we get a C plus. <laughs> yeah, you know, maybe a B minus. I, I think we're hitting the broad strokes, and people will have a good time listening, and that's kind of the goal. But uh, there was one part of the outline that I definitely wanted to hit because uh, the the focus of this episode. If people haven't been able to pick up on it, or if I haven't already said it, is what the Holy Ghost isn't, right? Yeah. Um, and what, what, where do they, where do they get this from? Where, where in the Bible? So, so it, it, when you look at how they approach the scriptures, the, it, it, rather than a pneumatology based upon actually what the scriptures say about the Holy Spirit. What they try to do instead is to take the book of Acts and turn that historical narrative into a uh, into a uh, something that is supposed to be normative of what the Christian life is supposed to look like right now. Hmm. And so uh, as a result of it, uh, they they turn it kind of into, you know, like an adventure story, you know, choose your own adventure. Your experience will be just like this. And so the, the, the basic assumption is whatever you see the apostles doing in the book of Acts, we're supposed to be doing that today. So you have... Yeah, you have Peter on his roof, and all of a sudden he slips into his trance, and he has this this vision of of, of something coming down from heaven. Well, that's supposed to happen to you too, and and so the idea then is is that when you kind of look at how they've developed this theology, so they've ter- taken a, a descriptive text, turned it into a prescription, and then on top of it, if you've spent any time in these circles, you'll know that they are known for their tall tales. And so always and again, uh, what happens is, is you'll get somebody who will get up and they will tell the most outlandish stories, but they provide zero. And I mean zero mm-hmm. evidence that to back up any of these telltales and legends that they do. And so the mesh then of their experiences, these legends, and then this misappropriation of the Book of Acts creates this, this s- milieu of just complete subjectivism. Where, uh, you know, and so, well, you know, and, and then they'll, they'll say things like, well, I'm not going to tolerate uh, in my life a, a, a Christianity that's, ev- that's even remotely less than, uh, mm. than what we see in the Bible. And so, and, and they, they sound like they're taking a bold stance. And I would note that very recently, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to name the lady, but there's a very well-known uh, Christian influencer uh, uh, who claims that she's a prophetess. And um, and she's one of these people who says that you know the Book of Acts this is normative for uh, for we Christians today, and I'm not going to settle for anything less than this. This is why I don't even go to any churches because no churches are completely sold out to this idea. This is what she said pub- publicly. And one of her sons died tragically uh, mm. just a few weeks ago, and she was legitimately delaying. Uh, burying her son because she was holding out for a, a miraculous resurrection for her son from the dead. Mm. And that's not the first time we've seen this happen. We saw this happen a few years ago at Bethel Church with the I whole you know, olive uh, issue. And so what the, and the thing is, is that when you hear a story like this, your heart, your heart cannot help but break because you realize that these people are legitimately caught in a labyrinth of not only bad theology, complete subjective experiences, and they're looking for exactly the wrong things, okay? And as a result of it, they they are utterly, utterly deceived, and the only way they're going to see their way out of that is if God, the Holy Spirit, for real, opens their eyes to see the truth of just how deceived they are. But um, mo- a lot of people, they'll walk away from Christianity, not even realizing that they, w- they never even understood what biblical Christianity was. They weren't ever exposed to it. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is the kind of churches where people at some point wake up and go, if I'm going to maintain any sense of sanity, I've got to get away from this stuff because there's nothing lucid here going on. And at the end of the day, they think that Christianity is just a false religion that's selling you a bill of goods. When, mm-hmm. at, when in reality... <laughs> They've never been confronted with their sins. They've never heard the comfort of the gospel preached to them as Christians. They've never been rightly taught what the Holy Spirit does in the life of a Christian. Rather than teaching you how to say, could have, could have bought a Hyundai, should have bought a Kia, instead the Holy Spirit instead works in us 
contrition, repentance, gives us the strength then to mortify our sinful flesh. And it's the Holy Spirit who bears the fruit of the Spirit in our life. And over the course of a lifetime, should you God grant you that, you can see that the progress that the Holy Spirit is working in you to get you to stop thinking about you and how to start thinking about other people's and, and 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 to love God for real and to serve your neighbor in good works, even if it wears you out in the process. But that's the whole point. But it, it's only by the Holy Spirit we're able to do such things. But they're not even remotely focused on anything like that at all. It's so heartbreaking, uh, especially because you're you're waiting the the lady waiting for her son to have a miraculous resurrection and it's you're denying the fact that like he already has yeah you know what i mean like in his baptism he had a miraculous resurrection and now it, you know it, yep. he's with the lord that's a miraculous resurrection gerhard it it just reminds me um he wrote a whole book on this uh yeah. and uh he talks about and i think it's on the resurrection um, he talks about salvation in like three steps, you know, and step number one is, is baptism. Step number two is dying. And step number three is the resurrection at the end of the age, you know? Right. Yeah. And see, that's the thing. I, the, the longer I'm in the Christian faith now as, as a confessional Lutheran, I, I it's going to sound odd, but I, you know, I'm 55. So I think I still have a few decades left. At least I think I do. I, I don't know. But, uh, but but now when I preach a funeral, sometimes I look at the guy in the casket and go, dang, I'm kind of jealous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because you know, my job as a pastor you know, is, and this is kind of another thing, in evangelicalism, they think that the, that the finish line of the Christian faith is somebody making a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. That, that ain't the finish line. Mm -hmm. My job as a pastor is to bury people in the faith. They don't cross mm -hmm. the finish line until they stop breathing. Yeah. So, you know, with, with each and every saint that I can be there for them as they are preparing to die or even taking their dying breath, and I know that they are in the faith, then I can say, ah, they've crossed the finish line, they've finished the race, and now they've joined the great cloud of witnesses, uh, you know, at mm. the, in, the, in the throne, around the throne of Christ. And I, and I think about them, I go, dang, I hope I can, I want to be there soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. You know, and, and so you know, it, it, and and it's that kind of hope then that kind of keeps me going because uh, slogging through uh, you know hours and hours of heresy every week to digest that in order to put together a, a, a YouTube channel that ain't very fun. And you know, I'm and, and and listening to these people blaspheme our holy God with their nonsensical mm -hmm. stupidness. You know, I yeah. I can't wait to no longer hear a single one of these people ever use God's name so egregiously in vain the way they do. So, you know, but but all that being, you know, being said, it's like when I look in the mirror though, holy smokes. Every day the the reflection comes back worse. You know, it's like, you know, the, <laughs> getting old is like it's like watching a slow motion train wreck. It's <laughs> like <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, it's uh, there. So there is something I have also noticed about the Christian faith, where like I'm not trying to die, but right. like I wouldn't like I wouldn't be mad about it. Right. You know? Exactly. Exactly. The, the other day, you know, uh, we had we had some uh, we had some folks visiting us, and uh, and and so we were the, the the subject of death came up and says, you know, do you have any plans to retire? I said, absolutely not. My hope is that I'm gonna is that I'm going to have a, a massive heart attack while preaching the gospel in, in the pulpit, right? You know, and my, my son overheard that. He goes, man, if that happened, I would be so jealous. You know, <laughs> there, <laughs> there's my son. You know, thinking, okay, okay, picture this. I'm just watching my father have a heart attack and die, and the first thing I'm thinking is, dang it. <laughs> man, it's not me. It's not me. <laughs> <laughs> it, he was like, gone too soon. I wasn't gone soon enough. <laughs> right. I think it okay, this this is the kind of stuff that the the actual gospel messes you up because you'll note that everybody on planet Earth, their biggest fear is death. Mm -hmm. I'm already dead. Okay. Oh, yeah. I, and this is what I tell everybody that I baptize, especially if they're an adult. You know, I I you know say, now listen, I'm gonna I gotta tell you this right now. I'm going to kill you 
when you're baptized. <laughs> Christ is, you're going to be buried with Christ. You're going to, you're, you're going to be, die with him. You're going to rise with him in the waters of baptism. And so that being the case, we can legitimately say for everybody who's a baptized believer, you've got the death thing kicked, you know, already done, mm -hmm. okay? We do our bucket list backwards as Christians. We die first, and then we do these other things later. And the thing is, is that when you recognize that you're dead in Christ, dead people have all the freedom in the world. That's kind of the whole point of Romans wow. 6, right? You know, is that, you know, should I sin so that grace may abound? No. You know, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life is just, don't you know that if you've been baptized, you've been freed from mm. sin. You've been freed from the dominion of darkness and the devil. So dead people have all kinds of freedom. Living people don't. Now, I'm not talking about the dead people in Chicago who have the freedom to vote. That's a whole other issue. But... Uh, <laughs> You know, but we well, Christians, we, we, are, we are totally free, and we already have one foot out of the grave, whereas everybody else has one foot in it. I, one thing I've been thinking about uh, a lot lately, and let me say, if we're talking about the freedom of, of dying to the flesh in your baptism, um, I'm, I've got to be free because, I mean, I've been baptized probably half a dozen times by now. Uh, oh yeah, just well, growing up in a costal, stuck, some, Yeah, right. They just, they just. Oh man, you hit your thumb with a hammer and said a bad word. We're dunking you. <laughs> you know, let's just <laughs> let's recommit. <laughs> I don't think they understand what baptism is when nope. they're doing that. Nope. But uh, one thing I've been thinking about a lot lately, really, is I'll talk to people at work and I'll say, "Oh, how you doing today?" And they always shoot back with some variation. Uh, I work with a lot of blue collar guys and they invariably come back with some, some twist on like, oh, I'm on the right side of the, the earth or I'm not pushing up daisies or whatever, implying that they're doing great. And for the past couple of weeks, I've really been thinking about that, thinking like, is this the better side? Is this really the better side of the earth to be on? Like, no. I, it, it doesn't seem like it. No, every day I wake up, I have to deal with my sinful flesh. That yeah. guy is awful. Yeah. And it's like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm tired. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and then, you know, and then, of course, I have to deal with all the other sinners in my close proximity, too. Mm -hmm. And boy, what a, what a cantankerous group of people, you know, of sinners we all are, right? Oh, yeah. And so you'll, you'll note that uh, to, to, to be in the flesh, although it is to have productive work for the Lord and for others, uh, at the same time, it's 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 the daily struggle of wrestling with your own sin, the temptations of the world and the devil, and all this kind of stuff. And then you, you just look; it's hard to watch as the whole world seems to be be, be sinking into a quagmire of of nonsensicalness. Uh, you, know, it, you know, since 2019, the world has gotten markedly more stupid, and off the rails. And, yeah, off the rails, and and you can see what's coming, and it's like. I ain't going to stop what's coming because I don't have the power to stop what's coming. Only God has the power to stop it. I don't think he's going to do it. But you can see that 10, 15 years from now, we're going to be in, in, in a crazy world where, you know, where death camps are going to be a thing again. You know, and maybe even on our soil here in the United States and the, and the, and the pace we're heading and the rebellion, that's, that, the open rebellion against God and his word and his commands and against even what he's made us to be. It's mm. just a matter of time when people are going to think that they're doing the world a favor by getting, uh, by getting rid of Christians. And, yeah. uh, and we're not that far from it. And, you know, I, I, if, I, if I continue on for a couple more decades, I'll probably see it. Well, Pastor Rosebro, thank you so much for spending this time with me. Uh, we have one more to record, and we're going to talk about what the Holy Spirit actually is. Cool. Uh, and that'll be, I think that'll be a great time. But before we get there, since we're at the end of it now, is there anything that uh, I can plug for you? I'm going to let you know. I don't know what kind of numbers y'all are pulling down over there at Fighting for the Faith. But I get about 12 downloads an episode, so... Oh, there you go. Yeah. Plug it, man. <laughs> <laughs> just, just go to YouTube and look for Fighting for the Faith. And if, you're not, if you haven't been exposed to it, you, I, there's no way I could prepare you for what it is that you're about to see. <laughs> That's good. Pastor Rosero, thank you so much. You're welcome, Remy.